Hello and welcome to Code Red's second webinar, supporting your child through their school journey with Sarah Assom. Thank you very much, Sarah, for giving us your time and expertise. Thank you also to Microsoft for supporting us in hosting this webinar. We are very grateful for all you have done to support Code Red with these webinars and during Dyslexia Awareness Month. We are so happy to see so many of you register for this webinar. Please remember to sign up for Code Red updates on our website so you know about any future webinars or events we are running. Code Red's vision is for all people with dyslexia to be understood, acknowledged, empowered, and to have equal access to opportunity. We recently released the Read My Frustration campaign, which aims to raise awareness of the prevalence of dyslexia in Australia and draw attention to the unnecessary pain and frustration caused by unrecognised dyslexia. We know early identification, reading instruction informed by science and supportive classroom environments would allow all dyslexics to achieve their potential. Take a quick look at our 30 second clip, then we'll get started with the webinar. Look closer. Try to read it, please. See, they're laughing at us. They'll say we're... Show them you can read. Please. I can't. I just... Sam, give it a try. Let's see how you go. One in 10 Australians struggle with the frustration of dyslexia every day, and it often goes unread. To find out more about dyslexia, go to coderednetwork.org. It's hard to admit to people that you have dyslexia. It's it, you ne because you never know what you're going to um, hear back from people. You never know how people will respond. Um, and whether they'll think less of you because you have dyslexia or, th or whether they'll think that you're not smart. You know, even as recently as a couple of years ago when I when I told somebody that I was dyslexic, um, my friend's father said, well, you can't go to Harvard then. You, you, you must not really be dyslexic. You can't really be dyslexic. And, um, you know, I think it's a lot of misunderstanding about the potential that that kids with dyslexia have and um, people assume because you can't read when you're younger and you struggle with reading that that means you're not smart and we know that that's not true. People have a lot of different ways of being smart and reading is just one way of getting information and there are a lot of other ways that you can get information and there are a lot of um, higher level thinking um, skills that individuals have that are more essential than just being able to read words on a page. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I have got my own children who have had their Part, they were halfway through their journey through school. My eldest is in year seven and my youngest is in year three. And they have both have learning difficulties that we have to deal with every day on a parent capacity. So it's, it's great to be able to share some of this knowledge as a parent and as a teacher and the learning journey that we've had to go through. As you can see here, there are many, many people who have successfully completed school and gone on to do great things with dyslexia. So these are a lot of the talented people that exist. Um, they, we, we know school's really hard for them and again there's lots of discussion out there on how it's a gift and it's wonderful and it's great they have lovely creative strengths and they do we do have to foster the, the children's strengths obviously but school can be really hard for these guys it can be really challenging every day and it can be a very very hard journey with its ups and downs we know and this is some stats from Victoria so this is Pam Snow's research that was done a few years back we know that teachers don't unfortunately get trained with the knowledge of how to teach students with dyslexia and learning difficulties. So this is some some stats from Victorian teachers. It was 38 percent correctly defined phonemic awareness, 41 defined consonant blends and 53 defined a morphine and 63 percent thought that reading difficulties could be helped with coloured overlays or lenses, which if you watch Lynn Stone's presentation, you will know that that's not correct. So again, what I'm saying is it's not the teacher's fault. I don't know any teacher that goes into a classroom and doesn't want to do the best for the kids that are sitting there in front of them. They all want to do a fantastic job and want to give the children the best opportunities, but they haven't had the skills and knowledge. And I certainly was one of those teachers 
I didn't have the skills and knowledge to teach my own child when she started foundation, she started prep. I didn't have the skills and knowledge of teaching reading in the best effective way. Um, so I did to start doing some research as a teacher and trying to get upskill myself with further training. So of courses and completed pretty much every course that's out there to upskill and give myself that knowledge to help not only my own children, but other children in, in the school environment. So again, Nancy Young does a really good representation of this. So we know that there's 5% of kids that you can sit pretty much in the corner of the classroom, your bedroom, your living room, and will just learn to read effortlessly. But we also know that there's 10 to 15% that just will not without that structured literacy approach, as you can see here. So they need that systematic code based instruction, which unfortunately at the moment doesn't necessarily happen in all schools that they, they attend. So we are hoping that, it, that Code Red is making a lot of change there and trying to get that evidence based systematic instruction. And there is some movement in Australia, which is fantastic. But we also know, as Na Nancy says, that this instruction is actually helps so many other students as well. So we know it's best practice for, for all kids, um, but it's vital and imperative that those students with dyslexia and learning difficulties have this instruction. So dyslexia is obviously, as Lynn said, this is difficulty with words um, and does affect reading, but it doesn't just affect reading. It has a big component where it affects spelling as well. It can affect memory quite significantly, and that's when you get to a high school capacity. It makes it very challenging to remember the changes in timetables, remember what things you need for classes to be organised for those, those skills. It does affect writing and it can affect listening and being able to take down notes and being able to sequence instructions and being able to retain those instructions to know exactly what you have to do. It can also affect motor control and handwriting and they can have comorbid difficulties such as dysgraphia or dyscalculia, which can also obviously impact in, in their learning journey. So one of the essential things that we know it predominantly affects nearly all students with dyslexia have a difficulty with their working memory. So that's being able to take those instructions and hold them and then do something with them. So being able to act on, the, on the, what they've heard and then use that in their memory and so this is really a really good read and it's very, a very simple read for both teachers and parents about how working memory can be overloaded so quickly and particularly in a classroom context where students are asked to do something and then we quickly give them some more instructions and then you know they're, they're lost these students. So this is one I would urge parents to have a read of and even give to their schools. So what it looks like versus your reality. So your plan is you send them off in prep and foundation and you, you expect that they're going to just head off to school, learn to read, learn to write, love school, enjoy every moment of it and come out the other end, you know, with great, great scores. And in reality, it's not that safe for that easier journey. Um, and even with my own children, it's, you know, it still has its massive ups and downs. Um, and obviously this year's had a, a few more dips in the road than, than many. So it's in reality, there will be successes along the way, but there'll also be big times where you've got to advocate for your kid and you've got to ensure that you're there and you're their voice because at the end of the day, you know that no one else will be and you know them best. And I think that's that's a really important message to remember that we don't forget. And often you hear that, oh, it's just a boy who'll catch up or, you know, it's OK, they'll, they'll get there. Well, I wouldn't wait if you've got a hunch as a parent that there's something wrong and you've got a child who's, you know, four, five, six, even possibly older, and you're, you've been saying, oh, no, I'm concerned. I've got concerns about, you know, what's happening with them, where they're going to, you know, they're not learning to read quick enough and if they're struggling, then I would trust your hunch and trust your gut instinct as a parent because it's, you know, it's often you will be right. Um, and that's where I urge my teachers to listen to the parents because they know their children the best and they know what makes them, what, how they learn best and they, they do understand what, what makes, you know, and a lot of these parents are very empowered because they have done a lot of reading and a lot of research and so they know the best way. I'm just going to show you a little video now which will explain a little bit more about you know how we how we cater for these for these students this is from understood.org which is a great website in America that you can refer to with lots of additional information so I'm just going to share that video with you so one of the one of the key issues that we have is that we leave it too late for students to be identified and, and picked up that they have dyslexia and they have a learning difficulty so many children are not identified early enough. So often we get to that grade three plummet of let's have NAPLAN and we found out that they've, they've bombed NAPLAN and that's our first indication as a parent that something's going wrong. 
So as I said before, trust your instincts and don't wait. So if you're in prep and they're just not picking up those sounds and not picking up that reading book and able to decode and read those words, then really go with that instinct because the earlier we intervene, the better. So we know that if we don't get into those students before grade three, there's a 75% chance they won't catch up and we're never going to say it's too late. But we, we know the earlier, the better with intervention. Again, as a parent, don't get caught up with quick fixes. Coloured lenses, behaviour optometry, supplements, you know, physical exercise. There's so much out there that, you know, gets marketed to parents. So here, this will help and this will fix it. It's not it's not going to be curable and fixable super quickly. That's just not the way, you know, the brain works with dyslexia. We also know there are comorbidities. For example, there are, is an overlap with students with dyslexia and ADHD, dyslexia and dyscalculia, dyslexia, dysgraphia and developmental language disorder. So again, we really need to iron out your, your child's profile and know exactly what's going on to be able to give the right intervention and to be able to advise the school on, on where we're heading. So assessments and screening. So we know that the simple view of reading is gives us a big indicator of how, how we learn to read. So this is the simple view of reading. So this is, we know that the printed word recognition times language comprehension, and this is really important, is how we learn to read. So if, if it's zero, if you have zero knowledge of the printed word recognition, which is obviously where dyslexic students fall down, is their phonics phonemic awareness, their reading comprehension, their understanding of what they read will still be zero because this is zero. Whereas if they have language comprehension, if they have a language disorder, so a developmental language disorder, they could have that and dyslexia, they will have a deficit in both sides, which again is going to lower their reading comprehension. But we need to know where, where this is falling down in order to give the right, right intervention. So the right intervention, having a look at the assessments and the screening and what's the difference? So assessments and screening. So screening is generally can be done by teachers or special ed teachers, can be done by speech therapists, whereas an assessment stroke diagnosis is different depending on which state you're watching from. So if you're watching in Victoria, it needs to be a psychologist that does the diagnosis still, whereas in other states they will accept screeners or assessments from psychologists, from speech therapists or special ed teachers. But there are assessments that you can do prior to that, not to diagnose, but to identify. And that's the key point. We want to identify dyslexia as soon as possible. So I knew when my son was four that there was a, there were some issues there with his, his language and, his, and he had indicators there. So we can do what we call a self screener as a teacher, which is usually the first step, certainly in our school. We'll do that first step. The teachers will do the self screener and then we'll know if we need to go on and do a formal assessment with the speech therapist. OK, they can also look at other assessments such as, you know, pragmatic language and language that the children would use in the schoolyard to whether there's, you know, overlaps with autism and things like that, too. We also have our plenty of screeners that we can pull on as teachers, and lots of these are easy accessible for speech therapists, classroom teachers, mainstream teachers. So the motive assessments we've got, I've just listed quite a few here, but you know, this is generally for in school use. So if you, you see assessments from your school which are using these, that is fantastic because these are the assessments that should be being used to identify these students. So the tills, the rapid naming, that's your ability to say table, chair, window, and really pull those words quickly, your processing speed. Your Dibbles assessments, your phonemic awareness. So we use at our school the feeler prior to entry. So we use that in the October before they start school. So it gives us that knowledge of where there might be some gaps that we can intervene straight away and not wait for them to fail. There's some good maths assessments out there, also some dyscalculia screeners. So what I'm saying is that teachers and schools can screen these students and I would urge you to speak to your school and your learning support coordinator and see what screeners they do have or the department speech therapists or you find a local special ed teacher that you can go to and get some it doesn't have to be a formal assessment for there to be action however if you want to form if you need a formal assessment and sometimes you will need that for your child's knowledge for your knowledge for you to know that that is what the cat what is going on. You will also need it down the track. Certainly in Victoria, you need it for for secondary level for VCE accommodations, whereas in other states you might not need that formal assessment. It's different state by state. These are some of the assessments you may see used um, by psychologists and again, different age, depending on which which age your child is as to what they may use. But again, often that IQ score doesn't give us the child's profile, so it doesn't tell us 
what their profile, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses, what the areas that we need to work on are. So often they're used even by psychologists alongside some of these other assessments that teachers can use to give that full profile. One important thing to remember is though that you do need six months intervention before a diagnosis. So you need to have had that, that speech therapist, special ed teacher, somebody working alongside to give you that six months intervention before you get the formal diagnosis. So we've talked a bit about simple view of reading. So early intervention. Again, we know that as early as possible, as I said, even you know, starting at foundation or sometimes even prior to that. If you're seeing a tutor, it's, that's a fantastic support. Again, what we want is we want that mirrored in the classroom, if possible, with the same instruction. Because if they're going off once a week to have one hour of tutoring, then you need to be following that up with homework if they're not getting the same evidence based instruction in the classroom. So we know that they need that structured literacy that we referred to at the beginning with Nancy Young's reading ladder. We know that they need explicit and we need explicit instruction on phonics, vocabulary, structured literacy. So what happens if we don't intervene straight away? As you can see here, so this is this is prep, kindergarten prep. And what happens if we don't start intervening straight away? And if we wait, let's wait till third grade, say grade three, and we're going to wait till here and then give some intervention. Look at how already how big that gap's already got. You know, even if we wait till grade one, which in, in the older models of schools would have given support for reading in grade one, then again, we've already lost quite a lot of ground. So it's really important as a parent, trust your instinct and get in straight away. What these students also need is these children need lots and lots of repetition and this is Ebbing House's forgetting curve and the reason you'll see why they need that repetition and why you know it might seem monotonous to you that we're doing those phonic cards every day or we're doing you know similar activities that don't seem to be very varied is because they need that repetition otherwise they're going to forget it very very quickly. OK, and until it's automatic and they've had enough repetitions that it's in their long term memory, they need that repetition over and over again. And, you know, to us, it might seem like it's very boring and monotonous, but to them, it's like new learning. It's new learning over and over again that they, they are they're starting to you know, connect and click and get that into their long term memory. So we must have that multiple exposures and that doesn't mean the same thing that can be exposed in different ways. They must have that multiple exposures OK, over and over again. So working in partnership with your school and that's vitally important that you are working together with them and you must be working together with you know it, there's nothing worse than you kind of getting to arguments with the school and you know the teacher's not agreeing with you and you're getting upset and then that's not going to benefit anybody so you need to work together with with your teachers your system principals your principals your support team your well-being team to get the best for your child so again, there's lots of other ways that you can get the support that you require. So find your community. There's people that share your experience. There's lots of Facebook groups out there to support you. Educate yourself. So again, it's not uncommon still to hear dyslexia doesn't exist. I've never taught someone with dyslexia, so you need to upskill your knowledge so you can then share that with the school and with the team that surrounds your child, whether that's tutors, speech therapists, whoever your, your team for your child is. Um, many schools are not necessarily aware and hopefully they are a lot more so recently with the Disability Discrimination Act and the education st standards. So it's again making sure that you're armed with, with that knowledge and not in a defensive way, you know, in a very partnership way that you know that. And I think schools are more aware now because of the NCCD, CCD, NCCD data, National Collection of Consistent Data, where dyslexia is included in that. So and I'll come to that shortly. Try and stay calm, which is not always us, certainly as a parent, uh, not always manage this one. It's really hard when you're advocating for your child and you see things are not going the right way to do so. Keep files. This is one I can't say as a parent, you know, more importantly, if you haven't got that documentation, when you get to high school, it's very, very hard to get those accommodations. So really keep every document, every ILP, every meeting set of meeting minutes, keep those documents in a big file and make sure you just have them dated and, you know, and kept up to date. Find your support and you know that might be a parent support group, that might be another parent, that might just be your family members already in your house. Um, clear communication with the school, so always communicating. There's so many times that I've worked with the parents at our school and they say, oh no, I'm working with a speech therapist or I'm working with an OT and we had no idea who they were or what they're working on or even a psychologist. We, we have to work together, so we have to know exactly what they're working on for you to get enough maximum bang for your buck of what you're paying for. If we don't know how they're supporting your kids, we can't all work together. And be prepared because advocacy 
starts all over again when you start high school and you start a new school. It's it's not that easy road. And even starting a new year level, when you get to secondary, you're starting again in year eight with the new teachers, year nine. There might be new teachers that you need to work work through these, these things again. So some of the questions when I always get asked, you know, how do I know what school to look for? And again, it's it's very challenging because you're obviously in your area where you go to your local school and there's a lot of benefits from attending local schools. But these are just some of the questions I felt that it's important that you could ask when you're doing, especially if you've got a prep child or a family history of dyslexia and you're looking for that support. And there are maybe options in your area between schools to attend. So some of the questions you could ask on your school tours um, that you could go through and go, OK, what what? What, what support is there? You know, what intervention? What does the reading intervention look like? Um, is it one to one? Is it group work? What training and support or knowledge do the teachers have on dyslexia? You know, what, what's the learning support teachers or learning support assistance training? Um, how will the progress be monitored and how often will we have SSG meetings and how often will we, you know, meet to discuss the progress and which accommodations will be in place even in a primary setting? What accommodations will be there for things like NAP plan or testing? So just some of those questions that I think there will be very useful for you if you're A, looking at primary school, but B, looking at secondary schools and where, you know, where your child is going to head next when there is more than one option. Transition to high school. So having just been through this myself in this beginning of this year, so one of the really big ones at high school for students with dyslexia and learning difficulties is homework. So often you'll hear the secondary schools will say, well, we only give homework for things they haven't finished in class. Well, that can be really, really challenging for students with learning difficulties because that could be every single subject that they end up with extra work to finish at home when they're already working 110 percent and are completely burnt out and tired more so than other students. So they're putting a lot of effort in. So just be really mindful of that discussion regarding homework and a reduced load. So hopefully the school will give you a lot less homework than than the other students because they, they won't be able to fit it in. And often these these kids have then got additional therapists and people they're working with who are also setting homework um, for them to work on. And it takes them longer. Organisation is a huge one for high school. So being able to make sure that they know exactly what they need for each subject and making sure that they've got the right books, the right tools. So something we did this year is we colour coded my daughter's things to match her timetable. So every folder was colour coded towards the timetable. So she knew when maths it was the black folder and it was black on the timetable. Um, because again, it's really hard for those kids to A, find where they're going, find the things they need. And in that Ziploc folder was everything for maths. So it was much easier. Keeping that routine is obviously vital, whether they're in primary school or high school. So keeping things with a set routine helps all of us, um, but certainly for kids with learning difficulties, it helps with that executive function and organisation. Students heading, heading to high school with additional needs may need some extra visits, extra orientations to ensure that they know where everything is, what's going to be expected. You know, who is their go to person? They, there's, there's always usually one person that they have as their go to teacher, their go to person, and they've got to find that person again, starting at high school. Communicating, communicating in a high school setting is far more challenging because obviously they have, you know, seven or eight different kinds of teachers that they're working with and they expect the students, particularly when they get to year seven, to be much more autonomous in, you know, their they speak for themselves. But again, you know, in year seven, they're still going to need the parent there to advocate for them. They do have several teachers and that's why it's really important to put a lot of things in writing again. So you've got that files section of your your binder section kept together with information for leading down the track of things that have been shared and, and information from the primary school. So for our grade six students, for example, we write a profile that goes to the year seven teachers so they know how these students learn, what's the best for them. We, we don't want to often the secondary schools will try and get the students to sit testing again. Again, if the primary school's got enough testing, there, there should be no reason to do that again. There's some great dyslexia fact sheets on the Dyslexia Support Australia in the files section. So, you know, go and have a look at those. There's a secondary guide that you can share with the school. And again, don't assume they know, because as I said at the very beginning, a lot of the, the teachers that we're working with, unfortunately, haven't been given the skills or, you know, the training to teach students with dyslexia, and particularly when you get to a high school setting and a secondary school, they will assume that these kids are coming up and can read and can access all of the curriculum. Whereas if they are, you know, one, two, three, four years behind in their literacy, it's going to be very challenging to access the secondary content um, without the supports of your technology from Troy and Microsoft and other technology that's around. 
So secondary school is different. It doesn't work in the same way as primary school. And I think that's really important to remember. It's very, very hard to give that that, you know, small group one on one intervention that primary settings can do when they have one teacher when they're going between subjects. So it is different. And I think that's really important to keep to bear in mind. So is it fair? And we often get this this discussion. Oh, but if we give them more time, then it's not fair. Well, yes, it is fair because they need longer. It's not that you're giving them an advantage. If we're giving them te the technology, if we're giving them a, a reader pen, if we're giving them Microsoft 365 to read the text to them, are we giving them an advantage? No, we're making it fair. We're making it equitable and we're making it equal for them to have an equal chance as reaching the same level as their peers. Um, but again, that's really hard sometimes for teachers to understand that if they've had 15 minutes more in a test than you know, or a reader for the test, that it's it's making it, you know, it's not fair for them. Well, yes, it is. And that's really important. And again, that advocacy will start again at high school setting when they have a lot more tests and a lot more exams and things that you for them to understand that no, if it's a science test and they can't read the questions, they need to they need to read or they need to use technology to read that to them because we're not assessing reading, we're assessing their content knowledge. You know, if they're doing a presentation and it's a drama presentation, there is no reason why they can't present that that presentation just to the computer on their own or just to their teacher as opposed to presenting to the whole class where they might feel quite vulnerable. So involving outside agencies and when to do that. This is a really interesting one. And um, again, the first thing I always say to any parents at the start of the journey is get the vision and hearing tested and checked to rule out any difficulties with vision or hearing because we, that's just a, a bog standard general hearing and vision test. So nothing, nothing looking, we're not looking at behavior optometry, we're not looking at, you know, eye training, lesson checking, eye training um, skills or, you know, making sure that there's there's anything more sinister. That is a purely a vision and hearing regular test. Um, and that's something I would say to all students starting every primary school at the beginning of their journey. And again, regularly having those checkups. Then probably the first border call often would be a speech therapist to do some formal language testing. So looking at if there is a language disorder there or if there is you know, something something more difficult than just the phonics and the phonological awareness, if there is a language disorder, if there is difficulty with understanding vocabulary, if there is difficulty and it's really challenging for students with dyslexia because they do read obviously less because it's very challenging for them. So they're not getting exposed to the vocabulary as much as you know their peers would be. There's also, you know, you need to look carefully at, at the speech therapist and who you are involving, because if there is an articulation difficulty that's not age appropriate, or if there is a lisp or a stutter, for example, there's specific speech therapists that should be dealing with those things, not just the general, let's head off and see a speech therapist. Then you've got your occupational therapists. So they're the ones that may be looking at things like fine or gross motor difficulties. If the students you know, are having great challenges in getting putting their fantastic ideas onto the page, there might be more to it than just that they're having trouble with, with spelling the words or it might be to do with the fine motor of the physical aspect of writing. They also look at some of the sensory side of things and sometimes if there is a additional comorbid difficulty that they might have some sensory challenges also. Then you may involve a specialist tutor and again there is I've just listed some here but they can do a lot of diagnostic testing as we talked about at the beginning so they what we want to look for is that they do have a structured literacy background you know and whether that's OG, MSL, letters training, sounds right, Barton, Spalding, Wilson, any of those are structured literacy. So it's really important that that, that tutor does have that background um, and because you know we don't just want to pick the tutor that's working down the road because they're the closest which don't necessarily have the training that our, our child will need. Okay, um, psychologists often you will find that these children with learning difficulties do need the emotional support so they may have difficulties with you know emotional well-being or anxiety to do with having the learning difficulty and being put on the spot and finding things a challenge and being further behind than their peers so it's really important to you know find that person as part of your team if necessary and obviously the psychologist would do that cognitive testing too if that's required Sometimes we might recommend that they head off to a paediatrician if there's other things arising at school as well, such as attention or they're having difficulties maintaining focus. And again, you've got to be really careful here because that could be due to the fact that they're struggling with the learning. So we don't want to quickly assume that the, the difficulties with attention are linked to an attention deficit disorder, which it can be comorbid with dyslexia, but that it could be that they you know, are disengaged because they're so finding the work so hard that it's not actually a specific attention difficulty. But again, a paediatrician, again, a good one will take some time to get into, but a paediatrician is a good place to go if there is additional difficulties cropping up. So accommodations. 
what, what we say is let's intervene really early. So let's intervene at the start of prep if we can, and we know that there's some difficulties already, and let's keep that intervention going. But when we start to get to secondary school level, it really is about the use of technology. And even midway through primary, to be honest, it's, you know, from grade three, they really need to be using technology far more. So they also need to have extra time. So even grade three nap plan, grade five nap plan, these are the kids that need to have that additional time to complete the task. They may not always use it because they often don't want to look different, but they need that additional time to be able to process. It does take them longer to read the text to be able to answer the questions. They also need rest breaks. And again, the, the children will dictate whether they want to use these or not. Sometimes they like to just keep plowing through and get it finished. As I said before, the reduced workload, reduced homework, use of a scribe or, or technology, depending on what uses, you know, what's best for them. And again, using a scribe in things like testing situations, the children need to be familiar with how to do that. It's not just a question of, OK, this person's going to write for me. You have to actually tell them how to punctuate it and, you know, where where to start a new paragraph. And so it takes it takes a lot of training to work with your scribe. Using assistive technology and reader pens, things like C pens, and again, the technology that reads it for you, which is really, really important for these guys. As I said before, if they're doing a science test or a history test or they're doing some history informational research in a primary setting, they can't read all that information to be able to, to, be able to then put it into their own words. Audio books. So even again, from, you know, from the younger years of grade two and three, when they start novel studies and start looking at chapter books, having those audio books available. Typing. Um, really important that they learn to touch type. Again, I, it's a really important skill for everyone, but particularly for students who are going to be, well, all students will be using a computer when they come to high school. So some of those available, BBC Dance Mat, Nessie, Touch Type, Read Spell um, are really useful. It may seem simple, but the use of a calculator. So dyslexic students hardly ever learn their time tables. It's very ch challenging for students due to the memory component. Um, so again, if you're trying to work out the area of something in a maths question and you don't know automatically your time table, that's going to hold you back. So again, these kids often get a calculator come high school, but I, I would be looking at that in a primary setting for certain questions as well. Obviously not for everything. The other one that's a bit of a bugbear is the, the old pen license, which you know many schools would wait until they're in grade four or five and OK, you can have your pen license now. It needs to be looked at a bit earlier for these guys, because if they've got dysgraphia or dyslexia and they struggle with the writing process, Often they will be the last ones to get a pen license and that will hinder their self-esteem. Whereas if we give it to them first, it often helps because you can't give too much pressure or too little pressure using a, a pen and a, you know, and a, rather than a pencil. So or even those mechanical pencils that pop at the top can be another one that's you know, really useful for these guys. So start it earlier rather than later. Again, documented, make sure your minutes on your individual learning plan, your individual education plan, depending what your school calls it, it's documented and you've got those meeting minutes. If there is comorbidities, they may require what we call a behaviour support plan or behaviour management plan, depending on what, you know, what your school calls it. And again, sometimes, sadly, we might need a back to school plan if the school students have had school refusal um, and have found things so challenging that we're becoming disengaged or at risk of disengagement, then we might need a back to school plan or a safety plan following an incident if there's been a bullying incident or so they're just some of the terms that you might hear as a parent and obviously be aware of or you can say I think we need a back to school plan so that it's documented and you've got that documentation there. Assistive technology. So I've kind of broken into and this is not exhaustive by any stretch of the means. There's a lot more out there. Um, but some of the key ones that we've used over our journey and are still using it in our school as well. So Reading Doctor, his apps are fantastic. He's a speech therapist, um, Bartek, in South Australia, and there's a lot of evidence and research behind his apps. And we actually use this as a whole school program now for our prep to sixes who have additional needs and prep to, prep to three for everybody. So Reading Doctor is a fantastic support for those early years. And in fact, you can use it with kids before they start school too. Osphonics is another one again because it's got Australian. I, I like the accent within it, just like Reading Doctor. Nessie has some great apps for and a program for supporting at home. So it's not expensive and you can buy for the year. So that's a really good support to do at home. So any of those first three are really good parent supports that you could use at home. Clicker, I've got some great supports available also. Um, and Kidspiration, which this is the, the younger version and Inspiration is the older version for mind mapping, which is often a skill that, that kids find really challenging to get the ideas. They'll, you'll see the kids are just like just sitting there because they can't start their writing because they don't know where to start and they don't know what the, to get the ideas down. And again, if you're a primary school parent, getting some decodable books because your school may not have any decodable books. So getting those, you can get those in many app versions with Decodable Readers Australia, with Little Learners Level Literacy. You can get those on 
on apps as opposed to the physical books, which is often you know more cost effective. And you can also get them free from Spell South Australia, which is worth having a look at. When you get to upper primary and secondary, we've got which Troy will share some wonderful software from Microsoft 365, which has been you know, a godsend for my year seven child, my own child has been using that really successfully. We've also got Vision Australia provide audiobooks, which again, they will find the novels you need. So they will get those made if they don't have them, if you give them enough time and it's a free service that covers students with dyslexia. You just need a referral from your school learning support teacher or psychologist or at your school. Um, so that's a wonderful service because these kids can often hear, listen to the book and there's a lot of research behind audiobooks and the, the functionality of those. Snaptype and Prismo, another another app that work very similar to Office Lens um, that I find very valuable that will take a picture of the document and turn it into a working document. But, you know, they they're kind of been superseded now with the Microsoft tools that we don't necessarily need them so much. A boy rides a scooter. The fact that over the summer that a child can go from basically nothing to having the world at their fingertips and being able to read and being willing to try, it's, it's more than a miracle. I think it's more than anybody can, can expect. Microsoft plus accessibility. The boy enters a home. Even in kindergarten, Anji was incredibly bright, but he couldn't read. The difficulty reading continued to second grade. Shortly after Anju was diagnosed with dyslexia, a friend of mine said she saw something online about a tool for Microsoft for kids with dyslexia. I made an appointment at our local Microsoft store. We went in, they downloaded learning tools, asked Anju to sit down, and my son read. It was amazing. Anjay reads from a computer. Anjay, in that moment, conquered the sphere and realized that he could access something that had been inaccessible to him. I saw my little boy read and knew that here was an answer, that here was something that could change his life. Microsoft Learning Tools has been a miracle in our lives. He could get everything in the same font. He was able to lengthen his spaces between words. And that was amazing and so simple. anji has been happier, more confident. He was living his life where the written word was an enemy. And now it's a thing to be conquered. Microsoft. Microsoft.com slash accessibility. So when it comes to our technologies, we want to help students build a foundation for future success. So we know that kids really would rather miss out than stand out. So we want to make sure that the technology is there in a sort of a hidden way, in a way that can help them get the support without them standing out to their peers or the people around them. So in other words, our technology is all about building independence, but also the reduction of stigma. We also want to build institutions that have a really good reputation around inclusivity and equity. So as they open up these technologies to their students, the community sees that they're actually doing their best to build these inclusive environments. The other thing that we want to make sure is that technology isn't a burden to the teacher. We want to make sure that the technology is something that's really helpful to the teacher and helps them to engage every learner. There's a lot of tools in the Microsoft education accessibility space, but what sits at the top is probably Immersive Reader. It was designed originally to target dyslexia, but it's grown and developed where it's just helping kids from all different needs and all different walks of life. So the scenario we have here is a piece of text that let's say a year seven girl is struggling with. Maybe she's challenged by low vision or maybe it's dyslexia or something like that. But what happens for her is when she comes to this piece of text, she's largely locked out or at least locked out to keeping up with the rest of the rest of the girls in her class. So what she can do instead is she can actually click here on Immersive Reader. And then we see Immersive Reader opens up as a whole screen application. But the cool thing about it is it's taken away all the bells and whistles from the app. So all those distractions, all those colors, they're all gone. And she can make changes to this to this document inside the actual document. So she's not having to go out to a browser settings or a um, PC settings. This can all happen inside the actual document. And you can see here that when she clicks on text preferences, she can increase and decrease her text size. And she can also increase the spacing. 
And the spacing there is increased between the letters, between the lines and between the words. And we know that's really important when it comes to something like, like dyslexia. So that spacing can be accentuated even further by increasing the text size again. She has the ability, the ability to change her font. She also has the ability to change her theme. So she can throw that into dark mode or something that's really nice for her eyes. But where it gets really cool is when she hits play. The Pacific Northwest tree octopus, Octopus paxibolis, can be found in the temperate rainforests of the Olympic Peninsula on the west coast of North America. Now you notice in there, the ability for that to actually read with an Aussie accent. So it's actually reading the language pack on her machine or reading the browser and coming through with an Aussie accent. So you can change that accent if you want. We also have the ability to break words into syllables. Now that imitates the way that a teacher would teach a child to read, to break a word down into syllables and it's what we call chunking. So instead of having the aide sitting there doing that with the student, the technology is gonna pick that up for it. She can highlight the nouns, the verbs, the adjectives, the adverbs, and she can change the colors there as well if she has trouble distinguishing colors. And if she's really stuck with colors, she has the ability to click on the show labels button and it'll show those there. Now, the cool thing about this is the AI is really powerful here and it's actually contextualizing those words. So instead of just looking at a word, say, like tag and reading it as a, as a verb, it'll look at it and say, are we going to play tag? And it'll throw it in as a noun. Very, very cool. The other thing that's nice is the line focus. So that reduction of distraction even further is right there. And now when we hit play. The habitat lies on the eastern side of the Olympic mountain range, adjacent to Hood Canal. You can see it's it's reduced that. And of course, let me not forget the ability to speed it up and slow it down, of course, is there. The other thing that we've got is what's called the picture dictionary. And this is powered by Boardmaker. So if anyone knows Boardmaker as a, as a tool, you know it's really, really good. When I click on some of these words now, I'm going to get a picture dictionary that's going to pop up and give me prompts. So advocacy. I'll talk about the awareness card or video in a second and how important that is. Um, the other thing I think that is really hard to change would be the school culture of them using the dyslexia word. It's a word that some schools still won't even use. And, you know, we know it's out there and it, we know it does exist and we know it's it's real. Um, so that takes a, a considerable amount of time to make change in the educational settings. It does take some time to turn things around. Again, continued teacher PD, and I don't see that any harm in sharing things like this talk with your school to get them to have a look at, um, because teachers always want to know more. And if they say, oh, we've never taught someone with dyslexia before, it's just that they haven't had that training or haven't been given that opportunity to learn about you know, how to support these students. Create or join that parent support group. So you could be the instigator at your school and try and you know, help support the other parents. Say, could I have a, you know, a lunchtime club where we, we get together and we share? So the kids will also need to find their tribe. So they'll need to find like minded peers that can support them. Um, the last the, the last thing I wanted to mention here was about the NCCD data. So again, dyslexia is included in the National Collection of Consistent Data. It's under cognitive. So it's not there's four categories. There's physical, sensual, physical, social, emotional, sensory and cognitive. Um, and dyslexia comes under cognitive. There's four levels there of quality differentiated teaching practice. You'll hear that referred to as QDTP, supplementary, substantial and extensive. And those categories all have to put in August every year at every school, whether it's government, independent, Catholic. You have to submit the, st the, the stats of how many students you have with those difficulties. And parents should be aware that your child has been included in the NCCD data. So you can ask your school at what level and, and students with dyslexia are included within that. So it's really important that they are. And again, they have to have had 10 weeks of one of these interventions to be able to be included. So that will give you kind of your leg up of going, well, they need some support. What supports there? If they've got an individual learning plan, they definitely should be included on that, that data. Identify their strengths and things they love. Again, you've got to really foster those skills and, you know, whether that be animals or art or whatever their, their strengths are, foster, foster those. This is the awareness card that I was talking about previously. So again, this is a really good way of at the beginning of every year 
get your child to help you. It needs to be their words. It needs to be their input. And I'm more than happy to share kind of the template for this one. It needs to, it's a good one to start high school with too. So they have it in their bag and they can, they don't have to say anything. They can just show it to the teacher. Go, okay, this is what, this is what I struggle with. This, this is what I find hard. This is also what I love and how you can hook me in, you know, because that can have a big indicator on that, that teacher having that first connection with those kids. Great for relief teachers too. If you've got a relief teacher coming in and they have this with them, they're not going to flounder and undo some good work the teacher has already done. So get yourself, empower yourself with knowledge. So these are just some links that you can go to, to obviously Code Red have a, a vast array of knowledge on their website that you can refer to. Learning Difficulties Australia also have some weekly Wednesday webinars, which are well worth sharing with your school. So they are available on their YouTube channel. Dyslexia Support Australia is a great Facebook group and they have numerous regional Facebook groups that you can link into for your state. Outside the Square have three films that you can watch again for free. None of these, are, these are all completely free. If we've got anybody across from New Zealand watching this, which hopefully we do, there are some wonderful chats with Carla on the Learning Matters Limited Facebook page recently. Um, so they are well worth having a look at and going back through on her Facebook page. Spellphabet, who's a speech therapist, Alison Clark in Victoria, who has some awesome blogs and things available on her on her page also. Spelled again, a, a national nationwide group, but they have spelled in different states. This is a nationwide link, but there are different you know, spells in, based in every single state. And five from five have some fabulous information, both for parents and for teachers. So that's well worth having a look at. So if you haven't been to all of these links, that's your, your reading for after today and your homework. One thing I did want to highlight to you would be the MUSEC briefings. They're not in, they're not in production at the moment. So Macquarie University have stopped creating new ones, but many of them are still extremely relevant. So Alison Clark has managed to save all of those for us on her website, on her blog. So if we have a look here, the MUSEC briefings, which were up until 2018, but many still relevant now. So let's have a look, for example, at the first one, the Davis Dyslexian Programme. Again, as I said, some of them will be, not all of them will be negative. Some of them will be positive also. Hang on, it's not working. Oh, here we go. So as you see, it's a very, they're just one page documents that go into various your programs that are linked with dyslexia and it will give you a verdict at the end whether they're recommended or not. So again, these are really good as a parent to take to school and say, OK, the school are recommending Cognit, the school are recommended Cellfield, the school are recommended tinted lenses and overlays. We can give them that one page document and say, look, you know, this is this is Macquarie University. They've done some research on it and they're not recommending this as as an intervention for my for my child. So really worth having a look at those. And it's great that they're still available because um, they aren't yeah, not being added to you anymore. But there's a lot there that you can have a look at. So a really good resource to pull from. Um, so, yeah, again, have a look on Alison Clark's page, but really relevant. A lot of those are still being are still relevant now. And there are a lot of recommendations there that's, that children are still given from their schools or therapists or even in psychologist reports where, you know, head off and do Cognit or well, no, it's not recommended. So really put, how, keep that little website link because it's a, a useful one. I'm going to finish with a message from my daughter who's now in year seven um, on what she wants, you know, what she wants you to hear as parents and teachers. There might be some teachers watching also. Hi, my name's Harriet. I've just left here in Jessica Puglia and I'm in year seven. So here's some tips that I, th that I think could help you and your child get through. Um, so I always found it e particularly better if I had the, um, the, the teachers send the work through before. And I also, we, in my classroom, we had this table that you could go to and kind of get help if you still didn't understand. But if you don't have that, just use the first option, explain it to them. Um, and then also, I had some, you can always get friends to explain it to you. If it sends your child's personality, but it, could, it really helped me get through it with when my friends helped me. It was really helpful in a way. And yeah, but as you probably know dyslexia can be really hard so you just kind of need to understand and help them through it because they don't want to i i know no one wants to feel alone through it through it yeah so thanks for listening bye look closer try to read it please see they're laughing at us they'll say where show them you can read please I can't. I just... Sam, give it a try. Let's see how you go. One in ten Australians struggle with the frustration of dyslexia every day, and it often goes unread. 
To find out more about dyslexia, go to coderednetwork.org.